Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, this is a very good time slot. Usually, all my talks are after the lunch, and people are sleeping very well in my talks. So I hope that right now it's a better time slot and, and you will be more engaged. Uh, but maybe it's me. Let's see. So uh, we're going to talk today about uh, prioritization of uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and I think this is going to be, I'm going to show you a few new things, um, or maybe you're already knowing them, which is good. Um, but I think that we have to start to look at vulnerability prioritization in a different way. So just a little word before I start. Uh, this talk was meant to be given by Oshrat, who is a DevRel at Armo. Um, and sorry, she couldn't make it because of the situation at home at Israel. Um, but shout out to him for, for, pre for making this presentation happen. So, um, a question here. Uh, who is in uh, CV shock? Any hand? Whoa, love hands. So the second question is, okay, what's a CV shock? And um, the third thing here is that you can see this definition from, uh, from Twitter, um, which is uh, totally understandable. And to be frank, it is a kind of funny story, which I won't go inside, but it turns out that this, I had already a talk two years ago about with the, I'm using this term. And later on, someone used the same term. So I was really happy to see that on the Twitter, someone coined, uh, used my term, which I coined. Uh, but in general, the idea is that CVs, which we are uh, vulnerabilities, which we are getting for different vulnerability scanners, are really overwhelming. And there, it's really hard to maintain uh, our software with them. So just a few words about me. Uh, I'm Ben, uh, co-founder and CTO at Armo, uh, also a CNCF project maintainer and contributor to other projects. Um, coming from the security world, um, this is more or less about me. Uh, happy to chat with anyone if you want to talk more. So when today we are looking for CVs, looking for vulnerabilities, how do we do that? And as I see, since a lot of people of you are in shock, I'm sure that you are doing already in different you know, places. Now, uh, many of us are using different public images. Um, and actually, these public images will make sense a little bit later more. But just to, to give you a hint, uh, we are talking about these public images because they are very frequently used in many organizations. So I'm sure that you know all of the names here. Uh, but you can see that they are very, very widely ad adopted. And we are scanning for uh, them for vulnerabilities uh, to manage our security posture, but for more to manage our security exposure. Um, but if we're we going to, through these public images, we can see that we all know that they are coming with caveats. These caveats are uh, the security issues they are coming with them. So it's really, we are enjoying all these uh, open source softwares and publicly available uh, technologies, but they are coming with their issues themselves and we need to like handle them. Now, if you're looking at the same images, what are the number of vulnerabilities here? And I'm, you know, there are different versions of this I know and different times. So this is just a snapshot of a given version and a given time that I just brought this uh, together with Osha to, to, to give you a hint of the idea. So you can understand that you have tens, if not more than 100 vulnerabilities which are coming with these, I mean, no vulnerabilities that are coming with uh, these images. And it's really hard to, man uh, to manage them. Now, where are we looking for vulnerabilities? We are looking for vulnerabilities in, uh, uh, in our images, in our CI CD pipeline when we are building our own images or uh, when we are delivering it to our registry or inside our registry. But as I see and as we see it, one of the most important things to do, and of course it's very important to, to block images with known critical vulnerabilities in your CI CD pipeline, but it's even more important to, uh, uh, to monitor the vulnerabilities you have in your production software. Why? Because Every day, there are more than 100 new CVs which are being uh, published uh, by NVD. 
it means that every day, by every day that your software is running more in your production system, there is a higher chance that there is a vulnerability uh, that you are not knowing of or uh, uh, you missed during the delivery time of your software and it's lurking around in, in your software and attackers can exploit it. So it's really important to monitor the actual happening. But to, to, to tell the hard truth is that there is a clear difference between vulnerabilities and exploitations. So vulnerability can exist in your workloads, but there is a good chance, a very, very good chance, and I don't want to go into numbers, but it's an overwhelming number of them, cannot be exploited. It means that from my point of view, as a security, pro, uh, 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 as a guy who's coming from the security field, I don't see a point in, in investing them, uh, uh, to fix them too much because uh, why to fix something that cannot hurt me? And every one of us know that everyone who practices this knows that fixing vulnerabilities and updating images comes at a great cost. Um, and today, also as an entrepreneur who are like, seeing how much time my DevOps is investing into fixing vulnerabilities uh, uh, in our production system, I can attain that I only want to focus on those vulnerabilities which, which can really hurt my, uh, my system. And there is a big difference. So how do I get to this? How can I say about the vulnerability? How can I prioritize the vulnerabilities? What to fix and what to not? So there is a great deal of, of the context where your application is running. So can the attacker come from the public internet and, and use that API, which is vulnerable? This is one question, depends on your setup, right? Um, there are multiple things, whether this vulnerability is reachable for the attacker in the sense that whether the software runs using our scanning containers and will return to this thing a little bit later, but there are a lot of software in your containers which are actually not used. And if it's not used, and it's really hard to exploit them, right? So, um, so there are multiple factors going into the prioritization, and uh, and it takes time, and takes resources in the, uh, in our work to to decide them. And if you have tens, or if not hundreds of, of vulnerabilities per image, all these uh, 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 all these. Res uh, uh, checks and tests are taking time. Uh, if you are big, uh, coming from a big company uh, who are investing in a lot, you might have security analysts in your team who are doing, this is their daily job to do that. But if you're coming from a not, not a big company, uh, you don't have that. You don't have simply that function in your company whose his job is to like go after and deal with all these things. But you still have, you might have exploitable vulnerabilities. But for sure, you have vulnerabilities in your uh, images, but you just don't know what to do in them. So the first and most classical way to prioritize vulnerabilities, right, is CVSS. I don't think that anyone who've used any kind of vulnerability scanner uh, is, uh, doesn't know this, uh, uh, this uh, technology. CVSS is a way to describe the effects of a vulnerability and give them some kind of a score for prioritization. NVD, if you're talking today and NIST today, uh, they're saying that it was never really meant to be a very good uh, prioritization metric, but in a the practice, there is nothing else. There is, up until like a few, uh, not so long ago, no one really came up with something that is much better than this. And the way it works is that when I find a, a, a security issue, uh, a vulnerability in some software, I'm, as someone who found a lot of uh, security issues and submitted it to NVD report, I'm just self-filling out a, 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 a questionnaire about different aspects of vulnerability, whether the attacker needs to have network access or the attacker needs uh, to exploit the vulnerability or it needs to have, be run on the same machine, uh, whether the attacker needs user interaction or not, whether this vulnerability affects the, uh, uh, the confidentiality, the integrity uh, uh, and the availability of the software. And depending on these parameters, we are getting a number between the range of zero and 10. And obviously 10 is the worst. You have to, like, uh, should be like, 
I would say you could be dealing with them first. And zero is like kind of okay because it's most likely it's not a real vulnerability at all. But it's, there hasn't been like widely adopted any other metric to deal with this. So there has been uh, uh, lately uh, uh, open, there was a new, there is a new uh, way to see whether there are exploits uh, for vulnerability. So there is key VCAV, uh, which is also by, uh, uh, by CISA. It's no, for known exploited vulnerabilities. It's a list of vulnerabilities which, known, uh, which uh, we, they know that there is their reports that in the outside there are, there are actual exploits targeting uh, 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 this vulnerability. So it's a very, very good way to, um, to describe whether your vulnerability can be exploited because someone filled a report that this vulnerability was used to uh, was used in an actual attack or there is a known exploit example out there in metasploit or any other kind of of, of tool and if you know that there is a uh, this vulnerability is, is exploited in out in the wild then obviously this is something that you have to take into account when you're prioritizing your vulnerabilities so we'll think that cool really great I have CAV, I can disregard uh, 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 CVSS. I need to solve all, uh, uh, solve all those vulnerabilities in my production system which are in the CAV database. And all the others are for now okay because they are not knownly exploited. Now, the sad truth is, and this is something that coming from, uh, from our uh, user statistics, these are uh, our customers. Uh, where you see that total, under a total column, you see a number of vulnerabilities in their system. Um, and you can see that on the column of P0, you can see that out of the 23,000 vulnerabilities, only 41 of them are in a CAV database. So you can see that there is a very low number of, of, of actual uh, vulnerabilities in the CAV database. I don't know what's the latest number, but to, if I combining into, uh, we are at KubeCon, right? And we are talking about mostly about cloud native applications. So uh, we can be, uh, I can safely say that there are few vulnerabilities which were submitted into Kev database, which are, you know, uh, related to our environment. And, and this is like, obviously if you have some kind of vulnerability which is in Kev, you should be running uh, to fix it, but, uh, but on the other hand, there are too few vulnerabilities there, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't suggest using it just as an only parameter for prioritization. So, there has been a, l a great deal of work uh, lately around, uh, around EPSS. EPSS is a new way uh, to prioritize uh, uh, vulnerabilities. EPSS is a machine learning based uh, scoring system for vulnerabilities, where I'm done, and don't worry, I'm not going to go inside machine learning, among the other reasons, because I myself don't understand it, but, uh, but they are taking into a, a lot of parameters around the vulnerabilities, which are uh, then uh, translated into a number between uh, zero and one. This is a fuzzy output, meaning that there is no, uh, like not zero and one, uh, exploitable or non-exploitable, but, uh, but the exploitation output is in a scale, and in this scale, the higher you are in the scale, the more uh, uh, the more um, possibility that uh, that the vulnerability can be actually exploited. Um, and what they mean is that they are trying to understand from the, uh, from the uh, scorings and from all the vulnerable parameters what's the chance that this uh, vulnerability is going to be exploited uh, in the near future. Now, it sounds really, really good. Uh, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, I have, myself, I have like some doubts uh, about it and it's just because maybe because I myself don't understand it uh, uh, till the end. But it turns out that actually it's not really a bad, uh, uh, bad scoring system and I will show you a little bit later why I think, uh, why I got to the, came to this conclusion. But I want to see you something that will show you, and I think it's one of the main slides of my presentation today, and so we'll be uh, going over, uh, we'll taking time going over it. So it's going, I'm going to explain why EPSS is a good tool uh, and what they are trying to solve. So you can see on the left side, you can see how the scoring system worked with CVSS. 
So you can see that the, uh, I would say the light bluish grayish uh, a circle representing all the CVs uh, 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 in my system. And uh, uh, out of the system, I, I put a threshold, or actually this is from the uh, EPSS documentation, and they put a threshold of, 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 they want to solve out of all of my security, uh, 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 all of my vulnerabilities, they want to solve only those who have CVSS score 8.8 .8 and above. This, they said that this is an effort of solving uh, 253 vulnerabilities out of 1,000. We, and then, uh, uh, to, do, uh, to say the thing, they also took into account which of those, manually they created statistics, which out of those can be really exploited. And the, uh, the reddish, pinkish uh, 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 circle shows those vulnerabilities that can be out of the all vulnerabilities can be exploited. You can see that around half of these, uh, they've covered nearly half of these vulnerabilities by the threshold. So there are 50% coverage of all the uh, exploited, uh, exploited vulnerabilities they say they are fixing by, uh, by giving this threshold. And it gives them an eff efficiency of 5%. Uh, of, uh, 5%. Uh, because the point here is that they are investing a lot of time, a lot of time of fixing a lot of vulnerabilities and, and still, they are only covering only half of, uh, half of the vulnerabilities uh, uh, um, that they should have been from the beginning. So out of the, uh, out of the thousand uh, vulnerabilities, only 5% they, they uh, hit out of all the exploited vulnerabilities. So if we're going to the two EPSS, different versions of the EPSS scoring system, you can see a big difference in the way they, they, uh, they, are, they have uh, the effort they put in. Why? Because they put a th another threshold, obviously a threshold between zero and one, and they said that they are going to fix, uh, fix in the first version 93 out of the thousand, and they are still covering around 50% of the exploited, uh, exploitable vulnerabilities, and this gives them an efficiency of nearly uh, 13%. If we are going to EPSS, V.2, when they give another threshold, and they are only fixing 47% out of the thousand, they still got, uh, have a coverage of fixing the, uh, among all the vulnerable, uh, uh, really exploitable vulnerabilities, they are fixing, again, nearly half of them, but they were much more efficient because they, with all the, among all those they have fixed, they hit 42%, uh, 42.5%, uh, of the exploited vulnerabilities. So I know it's hard for to understand for the first time, but what you have to take uh, from here is this. They created a scoring system where they are saying we are, we are better identifying the exploitable uh, uh, vulnerabilities. We might not covering them all of them, but with a much less effort using the scoring system, you can still cover all, uh, cover all the, uh, the, the same thing you used to cover with CVSS. So if with CVSS, uh, uh, with a th really high threshold, you worked really, really hard to fix hundreds of vulnerabilities, now you're fixing only below 50 vulnerabilities, but you are getting the same coverage, which is actually a, a, a saving time for your, uh, for your uh, uh, company and for your workforce, which is a, uh, which is a big difference. So here I want to introduce you to something uh, we at Armo and Cubescape came up with. We call it reachability. We used to call it relevancy, but then I, 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 I saw that people don't understand what I'm talking about, so I started a Twitter thread about, uh, uh, about how to call this feature, and actually the first time in my life that a Twitter discussion was actually fruitful. Uh, so uh, uh, so we, recall, we changed the name to reachability. And the way it works is that uh, uh, we are using eBPF to, uh, uh, to identify which software components are loaded into the memory during the runtime. And using this information to filter out all these vulnerabilities which are not loaded into the memory. And since they are not loaded into the memory, they cannot be exploited. 
So uh, now I want to go through a research and statistics we created. So again, returning to the, these well-known uh, software I've showed you at the beginning. So just to consider Redis, uh, I don't remember actually which version of the Redis this was. This looks like an old version because it, it has more than uh, uh, 150 uh, uh, vulnerabilities inside. Uh, you can see on the left side that what is the static scanner output gives us. Uh, again, we see a bunch of vulnerabilities, like 150 uh, 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 vulnerabilities. But if we are only considering those who's been loaded into the memory, we can see that we get considerably less, vulnerab uh, considerably less of the vulnerabilities because most of the components which were vulnerable are not loaded into memory. They can come from different places. They can come from unused modules in the case. But the most common cases is actually coming from the base images. Um, you know, these, are, these products are not, coming, not yet coming maybe from uh, a Scratch or distro OS images. Therefore, the, base, uh, the OS base images are uh, loaded with a lot of vulnerabilities. And it's really hard. It's really hard to, uh, to disregard them. And through this technology, uh, you, can, you can disregard them. But wait, because I want to show you a few more. So in NGNX, only uh, in the test beds, uh, we've used only 25% of the vulnerabilities were reachable, actually. Um, and, and you can see that, that only with you know, other components, I'm just deliberately like, going a little bit faster. Uh, uh, so with Argo CD, uh, you can see that less than half of them are actually reachable. Um, there is a huge difference between different kinds of applications, uh, uh, applications that are um, that are, for example, Go applications, which are built into monolithic binaries, uh, are tend to result in best uh, in more load, uh, more components that loaded into the memory. Uh, but for example, uh, C-based, C++ based applications or Java applications, which have a lot of tons of modules, uh, or applications with with very bloated base images, tend to show more uh, uh, more effectiveness. In the, if we are talking about reachability, uh, just for example, uh, uh, MySQL see that less than 20% of their uh, static vulnerabilities are actually loaded into the memory, and again, saving time. So, going after uh, uh, the, the, these things, so seeing that also uh, some cross checking, um, but uh, but see that there is a great variance uh, among all these applications. Uh, and we have to, like, the reason why it's very, very important to monitor us over the runtime is to actually detect what is really happening inside our application. So we cannot really build up uh, uh, heuristics uh, uh, which are general uh, to every application. Um, just another example of Kafka and, uh, and Jenkins where you can see that less than 60% you know, of them are reachable. You can see that in, in Grafana, there was a, uh, we brought the difference between two big versions, uh, 9 and 10, uh, where there is a huge difference in, in, the, um, in the reachability of their vulnerabilities. You can see that actually the, the number of, of unreachable vulnerabilities has shrunk uh, uh, between these two versions. And the reason for that, that they have swapped uh, uh, some of the uh, things in the base image. Now, getting to the, the back really to EPSS. So beforehand, I told you that EPSS is a very effective way to address vulnerabilities uh, and uh, as in comparison with what we saw before with CVSS. So we uh, showed that using EPSS, you can invest le uh, uh, much less time uh, in fixing vulnerabilities, but get more or less to the same results. Now, if I'm comparing EPSS and, uh, and the reachability, um, there, is a, there is a difference between these two. So I can already show you th that there are vulnerabilities in EPSS which are above the threshold of, uh, of 10% um, that are not loaded into memory. And it makes sense because, um, again, sometimes things are, uh, there are applications and, and maybe exploitable things that are simply not used in the container image during runtime. And, and, and you know, EPSS will never be able to tell it. 
because EPSS doesn't know this information. Therefore, what they are doing is they are based on the description of image. They understand how it how exploitable it is in in general. But on the other hand, you can see that that if I'm taking all those who, who are reachable and only concentrating on them, I might uh, also cover a little bit more vulnerabilities uh, uh, than maybe that maybe would be exploitable because actually uh, reachability is a great way to filter out a lot of noise, but it doesn't make sure that it doesn't uh, prove you that, uh, uh, that actually the actual thing is not a false positive. It might also trigger you saying things that, well, the, this vulnerability is loaded into the memory, but th there are since, as I told you in the beginning of the talk, there are multiple uh, uh, factors of going inside where uh, actual vulnerability can be exploited. Uh, the reachability is only one of them. And it, reachability, if we're focusing only on the reachable, which is considerably less than all the, uh, uh, focusing on all the vulnerabilities, it still might be, uh, cause us to work more than we should. So, um, so in general, uh, what we are eyeing to do uh, in the near future is to combine these, uh, all of these data sources and enable um, the cloud native users to, uh, to prioritize even better using both reachability, CVSS if they want, but also EPSS uh, in the way they are, uh, they are prioritizing the, uh, their uh, vulnerabilities. So again, to, to limit the investment of, of, of the users of how many things they have to fix in their environment. Um, just, uh, you know, again, uh, just a, a few words about how re this reachability calculation is working. Um, we are based on, uh, on the Cubescape project. Cubescape project was started by, by Armo, and today Cubescape project was, is, is part of CNCF. It's a sandbox project, and we are eyeing incubation next year. Um, the way it were, uh, Cubescape is working, it installs a node agent. This node agent uh, uh, is using uh, Inspector Gadget, which is yet another great, uh, awesome uh, CNCF project, to hook into different eBPF events. Um, it uses file activity information uh, to, to understand what files are opened in e each of the workloads uh, that are running on, in our Kubernetes cluster. And this information enables us to cross-check uh, uh, the SBOM together with this information, see what are the software packages that were touched by the runtime and understand that if they are loaded into the memory of not. So if a software package was, a Python package was opened, uh, we'll know it from the eBPF that a uh, given Python file was opened. We'll take the Python file and see if it's in the list of the SBOM uh, and it's belongs to one of the packages, and if it belongs to one of the packages, then we'll mark that package and say that this package is in use and it's reachable. And when we are feeding uh, uh, the vulnerability scanner with the SBOM, we are feeding it with, uh, uh, with a filtered uh, uh, SBOM where you only see in the SBOM only the packages which, are, uh, which were touched uh, by the runtime of the container. This is how it works, and this is how we're doing. So within the Armo platform, uh, where you see the results of Cubescape, you can already see that, um, I know it may be a little bit small, uh, but for every, every vulnerability, you can see whether they are uh, reachable or not. Uh, hopefully, very soon, uh, we'll be also able to enrich it in the next two months with also with the EPSS core, and you will be able to, uh, uh, to filter out um, based on these two factors, only the vulnerabilities you think that you should attain. And you will see that it causes a major uh, difference uh, in our daily work when we need to fix uh, vulnerabilities. So uh, as a conclusion, um, I think that there is a clear problem definition around uh, CVSS and around overwhelming numbers of vulnerabilities. Um, this uh, uh, problem has been, you know, around for a while, and as you know, we are getting all the uh, uh, IT community is getting more mature, and we are going, trying to make our security posture uh, and exposure uh, better. Uh, uh, we understand that we have to invest a lot of time, but on the other hand, uh, sometimes this time is, waste, is going to waste because we are th uh, doing things which which are not really helping us. 
uh, therefore, uh, also uh, uh, NIST, also uh, CISA are trying to come up with like new uh, proposals like CAV, uh, uh, like uh, EPSS. And uh, we, as a part of the cloud native community, we are also trying to do our, our best to be able to uh, uh, to, let, uh, to have us f f uh, focus on the on the most important things and solving things that really matter and not trying to go after all the the false positives. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, if you want to meet Armo, you can uh, meet us at booth uh, F12. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss it if you're interested. If you want to use the open source, Cubescape is available for everyone. Uh, we'd also love to have uh, feedback on that as well. Um, if you want to uh, give feedback, use this QR code. And uh, thank you very much. Are we taking questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if there are any questions, I would love to answer. Yeah. Uh, a question. Do you know if any of uh, companies in the regulated uh, kind of industries are picking up using reachability and EPSS? So, uh, like I'm, in, I'm in healthcare. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are multiple, there are two kinds of regulated industries. One is that where you have to define your own regulation and you have to stand by, right? And there are the others who are really like told to like not, uh, not to have, uh, who have SLAs for fixing uh, CVSS score seven plus. Um, so as part of the, uh, those, the letter uh, kind, uh, no, they, I don't know of any kind of, these are things are too new to, uh, uh, to get into that hardly regulated areas. But again, um, I think that, that there is going to be, where these things are going to prove themselves. And I think that they are, going, they are already proving themselves. So uh, I, I really think that in, in 2024, there is going to be a big push on, on the regulators to, to take into these things into account. So I guess they, they, there will be a change. In the self-regulated areas, it really de depends on uh, the understanding of the security teams. Um, and again, since there are so many times it's going to, uh, to waste, therefore I do really think that, that there will be a high pressure everywhere to, to adopt these things. I hope so. Yeah, agreed. Hello. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have an in the weeds question and a higher level question. The in the weeds question is, um, can you comment on, does the application need to be, how long does it need to run in order to oh, get a reliable understanding of it? And one specific use case we have is Argo workflows, which are wonderful, and they do some work for us, um, but they run for varying lengths of time. Um, so yeah. You can speak to that. So, Great question. Um, so I don't have a magic number. Uh, I don't have a magic number, and uh, uh, I can tell you that there. So I don't want to really go inside that, uh, that there were like companies and people who tried to do reachability even in the past two, three years, but they were because of different product reasons, the way they implemented it, that they started to monitor applications not from the beginning of the application, and therefore they missed a lot of information, and they, they, wasn't fil they didn't filter right. So at least when the way we are talking about reachability is that we are saying that we have to see the application from the start, and I cannot tell you for sure because there is no answer to how much we need to see, uh, I say that, I can comment it that in our Armour production environment, um, we are saying that around 10 minutes from the beginning, we are, we are expecting the results to be fairly uh, 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 accurate, but we are also monitoring the whole runtime. So even if a, a, a module is being loaded a month after the pod start, uh, we'll get notified that it become reachable and um, and to uh, to address the issue. So okay, that's that's great. So for the workflows, like I was describing, they're typically short life cycles. So 
the product would see the whole life cycle, so it would know. Yeah. But for an application, you're finding that 10 minutes is a reasonable rule of thumb, mostly accurate picture, is that right? Yeah, so is, this Are there is, any significant variances be between languages? So, uh, so I, I don't have like a very, very specific, like I, I, what I can say, but I say that usually we are, the reason we chose 10 minutes because our, our system tests, for example, are running less than 10 minutes, and we are expecting a code coverage around 90 something percent. So we, we said that, it, uh, that since we are getting to pretty high code coverage in our tests, uh, it's really hard to think that something is going to be loaded into the memory. But you are like, for example, Argo, and not just Argo, think about Jenkins, right? Uh, Jenkins, like, month after the deployment, I can install a new plugin, and something will become uh, 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 become uh, uh, reachable months after it. So there is like there is these special these kind of applications, which are real problematic from uh, this uh, behavior analytic thing. And uh, you know the only thing I can say is to monitor your always monitor your environment. Thank you. I see there are not other questions. So brief one. You told us about the about the new scoring system. I was wondering if you could just expand on how the conversation is in the industry and the community when, when first hearing about it, when digesting it, comparing it to CVSS. So you're asking about TPSS? Yes, about you know people's acceptance, people's mental journey to so, accept it, things like that. So there are, we've been running for tests on EPSS for six months. And um, we see some adoption by, actually by commercial companies uh, uh, who already put it in, in their environment and, and, and producing. And uh, um, we decided, like, after a month of tests, we decided that we are going to join the, the working group who's working the, the, on the EPSS. Uh, I, you know, I cannot tell that how the only thing I can tell you that from all of my discussions, people are looking at it that something that is so important for them that they want it to, everyone to accept it. So it's, 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 it's everyone see the, that the problem is so dire that, that, and they are so waiting for something really good to happen that, that uh, uh, they are ready to like hear about everything new uh, in this perspective. So, um, I, it will really depend, I think, it, the security industry, the decision makers, which will take time. It will take time, as we talked about it before, the highly regulated industries, it will take time for them to accept it. But since, I think that since CISA is behind that, it gives a fairly good start. So just like, and, and I really don't want to go into security politics, but, but had like an open source or, or, or organization would push, has come up with this and push this, I'm not sure it would, be, would succeed. But since CISA is pushing it, I'm, I, I, I think I have a good feeling about that, that is going to help. And by the way, CISA is not saying that it replaces CVSS. It says that it's next to, it to, should be used together with, EP, uh, with the, uh, CVSS together. Thank you very much.